It is time to look at another Ryzen 7 7840HS mini PC with a Radeon 780M, 32GB of DDR5 memory running at 5600MHz. This is the Ace Magic AM18. And I already hear a lot of you right now typing, oh no, Ace Magic? Aren't they the ones who installed some kind of viruses or something? It's been all over the internet and in, in terms of mini PCs. One of the reviewers did a scan and realized there was some malware or something wrong, but you know, the antivirus software picked up something. So the first thing I wanted to do was scan this. Now, Ace Magic said that that was because they used a third party to install some stuff. And when you're an OEM, you can install things like you know, a lot of times you need to install the drivers into the copy of Windows that you're putting on the device. But they decided to add their RGB software, which was not signed, and that was causing issues. And that's their story. But it looks like there might have heard other stories that this other company might have installed some tracking software or something like that on there. So I'm taking no chances. I'm scanning everything for rootkits. I'm scanning everything for everything. So we're going to start off with Windows Defender and do a full-on scan. That was good. It came back with nothing. And then the next thing I'm going to do is install Malwarebytes and we're going to do a full scan including rootkits. And that came back clean. Thanks to Hookies for sponsoring this video. Now these are OEM Windows keys. That means that you do your own tech support. You're not going to be relying on Microsoft and they're generally locked to the hardware. We got a coupon code. Click on buy now. Put in coupon code TS. 25, hit apply, and that price comes down to 17.19. Now, when you compare that to the outrageous prices for Microsoft, you'd have to buy this many, many, many times to equal the price of one regular key from Microsoft. As of right now, this Windows 10 Pro key will unlock Windows 11. We also have Windows 10 Home, Windows 11, you can buy it directly, Windows 11 Home, and we have two flavors of Office. Once you're finished, all you have to do is click on your user account up here, go to your user center, click on My Purchase Orders, just View Keys and Codes, and you can just copy and paste your key, hit Start, type Activate, click on Activation Settings, paste it in there, click on Next, and you will be activated. So head on over to hookies.com to get yourself an OEM Windows key at a price that makes sense. One thing I want to mention is they didn't leave Windows Vanilla, which has nothing installed, but they've removed like all of the bloat. So there's none of the nonsense that you normally get with Windows 11, no Candy Crush and Spotify and all that. It's really just a bare bones installation of Windows 11, except they installed Google Chrome. Ace Magic, please. I don't want Chrome on my machine. Really, Edge is better than Chrome. Chrome is a Google uh, marketing thing these days. It's just Google extracting your data. So use Firefox. Don't put stuff on my computer. Anyway, this computer is fast. And uh, they did a pretty good job of cleaning up Windows 11. So, you know, these Ryzen 7 7840 HS based machines are really powerful and they have the 780M graphics. Now that's built in, but it has 512 megabytes of memory and it's substantially faster than the Intel, you know, integrated graphics usually is. We also have 32 gigabytes of RAM on this model and you can see all the details here. This one came with Windows Home. I can't handle that, so I upgraded it to Windows Pro. Is probably, like I said, okay for 99% of the people who are going to be using this. If you're going to be using this as a server, well, then just put Proxmox or whatever on there, or Linux or something. Let's go through all the specs quickly. So again, we do have the Ryzen 7 7840HS. That is a 4 nanometer part, 8 cores, 16 threads, and it'll go up to 5.1 gigahertz. This one comes with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, and we have a 1 terabyte NVMe SSD on the inside. It will support three screens at 8K 60 Hertz. We've got Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2. We also have 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. You can see right there in the front where the large cooling fan is, we've got some crazy RGB rainbow lights on there. And we do have multiple different RGB lighting effects. If you don't want it to just be crazy all the time with the rainbow, then by all means. All right, so looking at the front, we have our light control. Then we have USB 4, it's type C. We have USB type A, two of those, USB 3.0 that is. Then we have our mic headphone port, it's combo. Then our on off switch. Turning it around to the back, we have USB C, that's power. And then right beside that, we have 2.5 gigabit uh, Ethernet. And then we also have 1 gigabit Ethernet. And we have HDMI and DisplayPort. And then we have two more USB 3.0 ports. On the sides, we just have some vents. This also comes with a little bracket for the back so you can mount this up. Let's crack the hood and see what's under there. It's pretty easy to take the, the bottom of this off. Just remove the feet, come off, there's a little bit of sticky stuff on there. And then you can just unscrew that and just pop the bottom off. And there you have easy access to both those sticks of memory. You can swap that out if you want to. I wonder if anybody's going to do that. 32 gigabytes of memory running this fast. I don't think I'm going to be swapping that out. And then we also have our PCI Express 4.0 NVMe on the top there. If you ever wanted to upgrade that, you could swap that out right there. So you know, I normally, let's go straight into the gaming benchmarks and then I'm gonna get into the canned benchmarks, but stay till the end because I do have a couple of things I really want you to see, especially when it comes to the, the temperature and the noise, because it does have a rather loud fan, but only in certain circumstances. But I want you to know about it because 
That'll be an important part of your decision-making process. But first, I think it's time we play some brand new old games. You know what new game interests me the most? Wrath. <laughs> Wrath, you're gonna ruin. Yes. So this is what I've been sort of obsessed with for the last week. It's basically Quake. It's running on the Quake engine from a long time ago, so it's going to run beautifully. And to me, this is just as much fun as anything that's come out in the last, I don't know, year or so. It does sort of adhere to the formula when it comes to first-person shooters, especially from this era. You run in, a bunch of enemies appear, you kill them, clear the room, you find the key, you go through the maze-like areas, corridors, and then make your way to the next area. Uh, unlocking doors along the way and taking out all the enemies that spawn in every time you do something. However, there are there are new mechanics in this. There are some levels that really, like, I don't know, that kind of change the, the flow of the game in a very interesting and cool way. So it's not just the same old thing. There are some cool new ideas here. Yes, the core mechanics are much the same. Some of the ways you traverse the levels, some of the secrets, some of the ideas they have going on here are really, really cool. So if you want a retro FPS and you haven't played uh, too many of them. This is a good one to start with. There's a lot of them out there. Dusk is also a really good one to start with, and they're all going to run perfectly fine on this little computer. All right, next up on our modern games that I like to play on systems like this, we're going to try out Pacific Drive. Yeah, look at this. Look how pretty this is. Looks just like outside my house. I could go outside, but no thank you. I've got Pacific Drive. So before we get into this, since this is a new indie game, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Oh, a tiny bit about it. Something has happened in the Pacific Northwest, and it's all been sectioned off, and somehow you get stuck in the Pacific Northwest, which is not a bad thing, except everything is volatile and scary. So you've got this car that you need to fix up. So it's, it's kind of a crafting survival game, and I haven't gotten that far into it, because honestly, crafting games are really just not my cup of tea. But I love how interactive everything is. And it's kind of funny, because I've been playing with the keyboard and the mouse, but whenever I get in the car, I like to grab my controller off my desk so anyway, you're, you're out here collecting resources, trying to figure out ways to get back. You're going to have to repair this giant radio tower to get out of here. But as you go through, you got to maintain your car and everything. So far, I've really been liking the vibes, like a lot. The weird thing about it is the save system. You'll go through big portions of the game without being able to save. And that's a little bit frustrating for me because a lot of times I have stuff to do and I don't have time to like spend an extra 15, 20 minutes to get to the save spot. So that's a little bit weird, but whatever. Ah, the car handling uh, sometimes feels a bit like an old school car. So anyway, uh, this looks, in my opinion, pretty cool. And it kind of looks a little bit retro. And that's because of the settings that I'm using here to get it to play at a decent frame rate. So I'm playing it at 1080p. And this is what has given me a little bit of a boost, my screen percentage. So I've got that down at 50. If I turn that up and go back, you'll see it looks a little bit more crisp. But we're dropping below into like the 20s, so let's turn off the car here. If this was Unreal Engine 5, maybe with Nanite, it would be a little bit faster, but it's Unreal Engine 4. Anyway, if you like these vibes that you're seeing right here, and you want an interesting crafting game, then I do recommend it. If you're someone who values your time uh, quite a bit, and uh, I mean the save system, they, they could have thought of something else, I think. I know the developers are dedicated to not changing it at all. But I feel like um, there's a better way to handle things when it comes to the save system. So that's just me. If you're okay with long portions of the game uh, going, you know, going without save for long portions of the game, then by all means, you do you. But just know this is a game you're going to have to be devoted to. I need to put a back on this thing. How do I drive around with these boxes out fo not falling out? This game's not realistic at all. It's pretty good. Let's go on to some uh, other games. <laughs> Did you think Nintendo could stop me from testing out Yuzu? This is Mario Kart, and we're running it at 1x, pretty much just the way it would be if we were on the old Switch. So see how this runs. It's always a tiny bit stuttery the first time around the track because it's, you know, building up the shader cache. But after you get going, it runs pretty well. Look at this 1x. It's, um, well, we'll keep going and just seeing if it smooths out. But every now and then there's a slight stutter, but it's extremely playable. Yeah, it feels great. It's buttery smooth at 1x. All right, I'll try Zelda. I don't expect Zelda to ever run perfectly on this. And we may have to switch over to Ryu Jinx, uh, which is a different Switch emulator in the future for updates to see how that one runs. But yeah. Right now, this is running great, so you're cleared to play Yuzu on this system. So the Tears of the Kingdom, um, you know it's kind of going sporadically between 15 and, you know, 30 FPS because it's building so many shaders. You can see down there at the bottom, building 700 shaders, building 10 shaders. It runs okay. 
Um, I think once the shaders get built, it might be able to get close to 30. Let's go ahead and try this in handheld mode. And it feels kind of about the way it feels on the console, which is uh, maybe a little bit insulting to Nintendo because yeah. And it looks okay in handheld mode. I would not really want to play it this way, but it almost plays. After these shaders get built up, if you run around a little bit, it might be playable. And there's probably some other settings you can mess with. So I'm going to give this a maybe. It's, uh, yeah. I'd like to keep it above 30 FPS. And it gets there. But yeah, it's a little bit stuttery. But it keeps building that shader cache. So and maybe once that's finished, it'll be playable. See right there? Whenever the shader cache is done, it's like 35, 37 FPS. So run around for 10 minutes if you're really dedicated and want to play this game. Run around for 10 minutes, let the cache build up, and you might be able to keep it above 30 FPS, especially in handheld mode. PS2 games? Well, they're going to work just fine. Why do I always pick JRPGs and have to wait 900 hours? Is there any JRPG that just starts? PS2 games? Well, they're going to play really well. I'm playing at 2x resolution. You could probably turn it up even more. It's just stuck at 60 FPS running on Vulcan here. I'm sure you could run some, you know, extra textures and stuff. There are some games out there that have fan-made texture packs and everything. So PS2 games are going to work perfectly. Uh, and your PS3 games, the ones that are compatible, should work all right as well. All right, Unigen Valley. This is running on DirectX 11, running it at 2560 by 1440 full screen. I find this to be pretty impressive for 1440p. So let's go ahead and test out 1080p. At 1080p, we've got 63.2 FPS. I also want to note that since I've installed the Ryzen software and I've been benchmarking, I can't hear the fans anymore. So that's really interesting. Superposition 1080p medium, which is where I like to do it on this CPU because that's where it's above 30 FPS usually. 4457 with an average of 33.34. Next up, let's have a look at Geekbench. We did our single and our multi-core score, 2193 and 12612. Let's scroll on down here so you can compare everything at home. If you want to look through all these tests, just pause it wherever you want to stop and see how much faster this is or slower than your current computer. And then over here we have our OpenCL score, 27. 854. Scroll on down and take a look at the individual tests. There you go. Let's look at Cinebench. Our multi-core score, which is what I'm interested in here, is 15520. And you can see, look at that. I know the Threadripper is a few years old, but it's huge. And this is tiny. That just shows you how far small mini PCs have come, because we're getting close to that. And some of the mini PCs have been even faster than that. So there's how it stacks up. Wow, the poor 7700K. Remember when that was the thing? Far Cry 5. Now this is running on high. It says we're out of VRAM, but you know, I'm still above 30 FPS all the way around. So the lowest it got was 37 on the high 1080p setting. And our average FPS was 41. Now let's be a little bit more reasonable. And we're gonna try the normal setting right now. Normal setting is not that much different than the high, but you can see we have a little bit better performance here. The average of 45 and a low of 39 FPS. Cyberpunk 2077 running on the high setting. The only thing I've turned off is motion blur because I, I just don't like it. So everything else is just on the default high setting. AMD FX Super Resolution 2.1 is set to quality. The average FPS is 33.84 and it did drop down to 27.56. It did drop down to 27.56 as you can see here. So let's go back to the settings and just bring it down one more time. Let's try medium. And then again, I'm going to turn off motion blur strictly because I hate it. <laughs> and I wish it would go away. All right, we're going to run this benchmark now and see how it runs on medium. It's really weird. The fan on this kicks on and it's really loud whenever it's loading a level. But once it gets in and we're playing the game, it's completely quiet. I don't understand what's going on. Like now that we're running the game, no, no fan noise whatsoever. All right, there we go. On the medium, it's very playable. 45.16, minimum of 38.08 FPS. Uh, if you're going to play this, I would probably play this on medium. Or if you really wanted to get crazy, also, this is on uh, auto for the AMD FX. It looks pretty good. If you really wanted to get crazy, you could come over here and tune up just a few things uh, and bring a few things up. The main thing that's going to kill your FPS, the screen space reflections, that's gonna you know be rough on your fps some of the shadows are gonna be rough you can turn this up it's not gonna do too much ambient occlusion leave that where it is i'll leave the level of detail on medium now things like cloud quality and dynamic decals these things are gonna eat up some of your vram i'm gonna turn up the local shadow quality only and the local shadow mesh i'm kind of pushing it right here all right this will be the last one my little custom setting 
and I'm gonna put this on balanced. This will give you an idea of how it looks with the medium high settings. I'll show you the inside and then we'll take a look at the outside. This is the my own custom medium high. I want the shadow quality to be high in the local area, but I'm not really caring too much about the distant shadows. And notice the reflections there on the on the ground and the water puddles. So I think my medium high would be the way I would play it. And we'll just see how the FPS is once we're finished. All right, so as you can see there, it's very similar to the medium settings, but it does look a little bit better. So if you're following along and you want to play this game uh, and you want it to look really good, but also play pretty well, then my settings will work. Medium works as well, but this looks a little bit better. So there you have it. Runs really well on this little machine. Ada 64 Extreme. Click on that fire. I'm going to do a full on stress test. We'll let it run for 15 minutes. And in the middle of this, I'm going to come and check and just see how loud this is. All right, here we go. So when it's ramping up all the way. All right, just while we're sitting up here, I'm on the desk, not saying anything. I'm going to hold it here. So I'm just holding it on the desk. This is several feet away. The ambient in the room is around 75. So it's loud. It's the loudest. And it's weird because it's not extremely loud while you're playing games at all. It's only when the CPU is ramped up all the way. Now this fan noise, it happens whenever you're moving a file or whenever the CPU starts jumping up. Like whenever the CPU jumps above like 70 or 80, the fan ramps up like crazy. It does it on and off. So while you're just using your computer, if you decide to move a few files and it requires the CPU to process something, or if you decide to unzip a seven zip file or whatever, it'll turn on and then turn off 10 seconds later. So it's like a vacuum cleaner being turned on and off. It's really unpleasant and it's kind of jarring and it's not a constant noise. Now, while you're rendering something or while right now I'm using Ada to test the, the machine, it just stays on the entire time. So it's really loud when it comes to CPU usage. However, whenever I get into a game, it, it doesn't really come on at all. The CPU is kind of just chilling the GPU ramps up, but that doesn't seem to be too bad. The GPU usually stays under 90 and it's not a big deal. But this one, it does run warm. And um, I mean, we can see right here from the tests, it's already hitting 88 and it's only been three minutes and 50 seconds. So it's really loud and it gets pretty warm. Um, warmer than most of these little PCs I've seen. But when you're gaming, it's like not a big deal. So is it like, are you going to be doing mostly gaming? Or are you going to be doing other stuff? If you're doing video editing or anything that requires the CPU, you're going to hear this fan and it's going to be unpleasant because it goes on and off and on and off. And it's just like a constant like, Ugh. it's it's I don't like it. The fans, it's a nuisance. So out of all the many PCs I've tested, this one has the most annoying fan. But the performance is also good, so it's like... I thought this video was over, but I was wrong. So as I was sitting here and the video was ramping up and everything, and I finished and I turned off my main computer, I was about to go turn off the small computer, it started buzzing, and I was like, that's weird. So I was like, well, let's just take a look and see if it stops buzzing. Maybe something's wrong, but it was like a, a, not a good buzz, like the case is buzzing or the fan is buzzing on something. So I took off the back cover here. Let's take a look. That little fan is creating an enormous amount of buzz, like a ridiculous amount. And it wasn't there before. What's interesting is if I put pressure on it, the buzzing is still there. I took out most of the screws, but if I take out the screws, now if I separate it from the chassis or from this little piece of plastic right here and pick it up in my hand, the buzzing mostly goes away. So now I'm just holding it right here and it's not buzzing. But I put it back in there and it's extremely annoying. I'm not exactly sure how to fit, fix this. Maybe some little rubber grommets underneath the screws, but this is, God, I wanted to love this machine because of the specs and because of the size and because of everything, but the fan noise on both the front and the back fan are just really not really working. It's just kind of mounted right here above these MOSFETs, as you can see, and capacitors to keep them cool, which is nice to have a fan right here. But I don't know, it's tiny little fans. These tiny, these tiny little fans like this are extremely buzzy, extremely loud. Now I get to f diagnose this for a while. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fix it. I've tried all kinds of things. I even tried to put some dampening things underneath it and it still buzzed. Basically buzzes anytime I push it down or secure it. But if I pick it up, it stops buzzing. So yeah, it's time to mess with it some more. So there you have it. Another fast mini PC featuring another fast AMD Ryzen 7 CPU. I just wish that the fans were not so loud. That's really the only thing 
that's going to keep me from recommending this to everybody else because there's a lot of different options out there. And there's a lot of different options that have that same part, that same, you know, the same GPU, the same CPU. So there's a lot of stuff that are going to be very similar in performance. For instance, the Geekom uh, A7 that I reviewed a week or so ago, it's almost the same when it comes to the performance. Same parts, um, you know, just a few differences here and there, but it's much quieter. And that's a big deal for someone like me. Now, if the price on this is lower, the price on that one's lower, you can go back and forth and see which one's going to be the best deal. Um, this would be an amazing server because you do have 16 threads there. You could put like some, you know, put a bunch of VMs on here, put this in a closet where the fans are, don't really matter that much. You're not going to have a ton of hard drive space unless you upgrade that, you know, that, that M.2. But, you know, you can hook it up to your NAS with a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, do a storage pool there and put a whole bunch of VMs on a NAS and use this as the brain to run them. That would be perfect. In fact, that would be really awesome. You could run some very high powered VMs. I'm talking like you could be running Windows VMs on here. You could be running full on Linux desktop VMs, multiple of those because of the RAM, the speed of the RAM, the speed of the CPU, the fact that you have eight cores and 16 threads. So that's something you could do, but this would be like kind of high end for that. But really something like this could replace a lot of stuff in your server closet and you could just put it in there. Um, so it can do more than just gaming. And of course, if you want to play all the games that I think a lot of times when you say gaming PC and it's an APU, I think a lot of people are thinking like Fortnite and uh, all the MOBAs and whatever. I, those games are so easy to run with a system like this that it's not even worth mentioning. Yes, you're going to be able to play Fortnite with everything turned on nicely. I don't know much about Fortnite. It's not my kind of game and can't even bring myself to play it for testing because it's so <laughs> so much not my type of game. But you can play it. You can play your MOBAs. You can play Dota. You can play League of Legends or whatever perfectly on this. Anyway, I think I've talked enough. Last thing I'll do is remind you about some of the sales we have going on over here. Um, right now, there's a sale going on for some of the hardware. Um, this mouse right now is 50% off. I, you're not seeing this, this right now. You're not seeing this down here, but I'm going to make it 50% off. So if you need a new mouse, the standard issue feels a lot like the old IntelliMouse. I went through many, many, many molds and, and shapes until I decided on this one because it feels good. And then I put my favorite flawless sensor in there. So this is the mouse that I use and I'll knock this down to half price for the next few days. So go ahead and head over to epicpants.com and get this for half off. The discount, if it's not right here, when you add it to your cart, it'll show up there. That's how a lot of the discounts work here. You add to cart and then you'll notice it's half price. So yeah, enjoy everybody and I'll see you all in the comments.